Steven Anderson is a well-known Baptist, quote, pastor who has a substantial following on the internet. He claims to be a true Christian, and many people sadly think that he is. He also claims to be a prophet. Yes, I do. Absolutely. I believe that God has chosen me to be a prophet to the nations, to preach the word of God, and to sound it out with no fear. The truth, however, is that Anderson is a total heretic and a demonic false prophet who rejects the teaching of the Bible. This video will prove that even though Anderson says some true things on a variety of topics, he is not remotely Christian. Stephen Anderson holds that people who have been given over to the demonic activity of homosexuality cannot possibly be converted from it. That contradicts scripture as we will see. Since Anderson wrongly holds that it's impossible for homosexuals to be converted, he actually recommends that they kill themselves. During an interview with the BBC, Anderson was asked what advice he would give to homosexuals. Here's what he said. What do you think homosexuals should do then? Kill themselves, as far as I'm concerned. Because they, you know, they're, they're horrible, wicked people. They're just going to keep molesting and, and, you know, destroying people. So I don't have any advice for homosexuals except to put a bullet in your own head so that you don't molest my kids or anyone else's kids. That is utterly demonic. That statement by itself proves that Anderson is a demonic false prophet. Let's be clear. We agree with Anderson that homosexual behavior is an unnatural abomination. It's a mortal sin that leads without any doubt to hell. We also hold that no one is born a homosexual. Same-sex attraction is not natural. It's the result of a rejection of God as Romans 1 teaches. The acceptance of sodomy and sexual perversion is one of the biggest problems in the world today. It's an abomination that characterizes these end times. We condemn homosexuality as clearly as anyone, and many things Anderson says on the issue are true. However, the Bible teaches that it's possible for people who are lost in the abomination of homosexuality to be changed and converted by the grace of God, just as it's possible to be converted from the mortal sins of fornication, adultery, and others. The message of Christianity to homosexuals is that you need to repent and be converted, not kill yourselves. God now commands all people everywhere to repent, Acts 17.30. To recommend that homosexuals kill themselves, as Anderson does, is to tell them to violate God's commandment that you shall not murder, and encourage them to commit an act that will send them straight to hell. It is satanic. There are, in fact, thousands who say they were homosexuals at one time but aren't any longer. In 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11, St. Paul lists various categories of mortal sinners who will be barred from the kingdom of God, including fornicators, adulterers, and men who practice homosexuality. St. Paul then states, quote, And such were some of you, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God, end quote. Thus, the teaching of Scripture is that it's possible for people to be converted from such sins. Indeed, to further expose the unbiblical heresy of Anderson and those who think like him on this matter, note that the Greek words translated here as, nor men who practice homosexuality, are in the King James Bible translated as, quote, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, end quote. Since heretics such as Anderson believe that it's impossible for a homosexual to be converted and delivered, they falsely claim that St. Paul did not refer to men who practice homosexuality in 1 Corinthians 6, when he listed mortal sins that exclude people from heaven and from which people could be converted. But here's the problem with that. Number one, there's no mention of homos in this passage. They'll take the terms effeminate and or abuses of themselves with mankind and they'll substitute this for a, a homo yeah, right. in the modern version. But that's not what the King James Bible says. Right. This isn't talking about being a sodomite. Such a claim is an utterly fallacious attempt to cling to their heresy. One of the Greek words St. Paul uses, arsenikoitai, literally signifies betters of males or men who sleep or lie with males. It refers to homosexual activity. In fact, the word arsenikoitai in 1 Corinthians 6-9 is formed from a combination of the word for male, arsen, and the word for bed slash a place for lying or sexual activity, koite which are used in the Greek translation of Leviticus 18.22 and Leviticus 20.13. In those verses, men lying with men, that is, homosexual activity, is condemned as an abomination. The Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Septuagint, was completed in the 2nd century BC. The Septuagint is the version of the Old Testament most frequently referenced by authors of the New Testament when they quote the Old Testament. So in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, St. Paul uses a Greek word that corresponds to the language used in the Septuagint in passages of Leviticus that describe and condemn homosexual activity. Hence, the claim Anderson makes in the following clip, that to say that arsenikoitai refers to homosexual activity is simply guessing and making things up, is utterly false. 
And I don't care what the stupid Greek lexicon says. I've studied it all, and it's, I wouldn't give you a dime for that Greek lexicon anyway. It's all just guessing and making things up. That's nonsense. The Greek word used by St. Paul involves a combination of the Greek word for male and the Greek word for bed slash a place for lying, and it corresponds to the language used in Leviticus passages against homosexuality in the Septuagint, the version of the Old Testament most frequently cited by New Testament authors. By using arsenikoitai, St. Paul was clearly making a connection with the activity described and condemned in the Leviticus passages. There are also numerous uses of arsenikoitai in Greek writings in early centuries after Christ. They understand arsenikoitai to denote homosexual abominations. Thus, in 1 Corinthians 6 9, St. Paul definitely referred to homosexual activity when he listed mortal sins that bar people from heaven and from which people could be converted. By holding that a homosexual cannot possibly be converted, Anderson rejects the teaching of the Bible and demonstrates that he's not a Christian. What do you think homosexuals should do then? Kill themselves, as far as I'm concerned. But this is not the only part of the passage in 1 Corinthians that Anderson rejects. Anderson rejects the entire passage because he teaches, one, that you don't need righteousness to be saved, and two, that fornicators, adulterers, etc. can be saved. Anderson is a heretic who believes in the false doctrines of faith alone and easy believism. He teaches that as soon as someone, quote, truly believes in Jesus, that person could commit any kind of sin and literally do anything and still go to heaven. Once you're saved, once you believe on him, you're saved forever, and no matter what, you can never lose your salvation. Even if I were to go out and commit some awful sin, God will punish me for it on this earth. If I went out and killed somebody today, you know, God's going to make sure I get punished. I'm going to prison or, or far worse or the death penalty. Whatever this earth punishes me, and God's going to make sure I get punished even more. But I'm not going to hell. There's nothing I can do to go to hell because I'm saved. Listen to me. If you're saved, you can sin on an ongoing basis and repeatedly. There are people who do it. That is a totally unbiblical false doctrine. According to Anderson, one can even commit murder, remain justified, and go to heaven. That is exactly the opposite of Scripture's teaching. 1 John 3.15 teaches that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Therefore, an unrepentant murderer cannot get to heaven. Galatians 5.19-21 directly warns the true believers that if they commit murder or another mortal sin, that they will not inherit the kingdom of God. Revelation 21.8 says that murderers will have their portion in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur. But the demonic, anti-Christian, unbiblical preacher Stephen Anderson teaches the opposite of the New Testament by stating that a, quote, believer could commit murder and still be saved. He is a heretic. Also consider the injustice that such a position involves. People who have had family members or close friends killed have been known to attend every day of the killer's trial. Even though they cannot bring their family member or friend back, they will wait with great anticipation just to hear the guilty verdict pronounced. They will often break down at the moment the verdict is pronounced against the person who murdered their friend or family member. They greatly thirst for justice to be rendered against the evildoer for his or her crime, because that is what is true and right. After two and a half years, the families of Kenneth Cherry, Michael Bolden, and Sandra Sutton Wasman finally heard the words they've been waiting for. Guilty of first degree murder with use of a deadly weapon. Is he not guilty, not guilty by reason of insanity, or guilty of murder in the first degree as charged? Guilty. Under what theory? All of them. <gasps> if the person who did such a thing were found not guilty and did not pay for his or her crime, it would be contrary to justice in every way. Yet, according to the non-Christian Stephen Anderson, a, quote, believer who commits murder, or even murders a whole family of people, including children, and is killed in the process, will, upon dying in the act of murder, be immediately received into eternal glory and happiness by the just judge of all creation. What a demonic blasphemy. It is a mockery of God and his justice. It is a direct rejection of the teaching of Scripture. People who follow such an unbiblical heretic and convince themselves that he's teaching Christianity and what the Bible says simply have itching ears for lies. Anderson also teaches that you could commit the mortal sins of drunkenness, fornication, adultery, etc. and go to heaven. It's as if Anderson is reading from portions of the list of mortal sins given in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and then teaching the opposite of the Bible. I believe it's possible for a saved person to become a drunkard. I believe it's possible for a saved person to become a fornicator, an adultery, even a, a adulterer, even a murderer. So, Anderson boldly proclaims that drunkards, fornicators, and adulterers will not be barred from heaven, while St. Paul in Scripture explicitly teaches 
that drunkards, fornicators, and adulterers will be barred from heaven. Anderson is an anti-Christian, anti-apostle. There's a reason that the Bible says do not be deceived in various warning passages that are directed to the true believers. It's because there are false prophets like Anderson who will present a contrary message. Moreover, it's an undeniable fact that in Scripture the warning passages about being barred from heaven for grave sins, for example in 1 Corinthians 6, Galatians 5, and Ephesians 5, are directed to people the Bible itself describes as true believers. For instance, in Galatians 5, St. Paul warns, quote, you, referring to true believers in that context. That refutes the false doctrines of faith alone and once saved, always saved. An excellent example of how the Bible teaches that true believers can be lost for grave sins is found in 1 Corinthians, although many others could be given. In 1 Corinthians 1-2, St. Paul specifies that he's writing, quote, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus. Therefore, when St. Paul states in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that various categories of mortal sinners such as adulterers, fornicators, and drunkards will be barred from heaven, he's directing the warning to those, quote, sanctified in Christ Jesus, to the true believers. Some heretics respond to this by asserting that the warning in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 does not apply to believers because in 1 Corinthians 6.11, St. Paul says that you have been washed and justified. But that's easily refuted. It is refuted not only by the context of the first six chapters, but also by the fact that St. Paul repeats the warning a few chapters later in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. So even if you want to argue that St. Paul only starts addressing true believers in 1 Corinthians 6.11, a ridiculous assertion that is plainly contrary to 1 Corinthians 1-2 and the context, it doesn't matter, you still lose. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, where St. Paul is certainly addressing the people he described as justified in 1 Corinthians 6-11, he warns them again. He warns them not to become idolaters and not to commit fornication. And he already told us in 1 Corinthians 6 that idolaters and fornicators will be barred from heaven. It's not hard to understand. In 1 Corinthians 10, he's warning the justified not to become idolaters and fornicators, the very people he said will be barred from heaven in 1 Corinthians 6. Scripture, the inspired word of God, obviously would not be warning true believers about being barred from heaven for grave sins if that were impossible. It warns true believers about losing salvation because it's possible for them to be damned for grave sins or for apostasy. This is how easy it is to refute the false salvation message spread by heretics such as Anderson. People just need to let Scripture speak for itself and accept its plain teaching rather than having it explained away by false prophets. Connected with Anderson's heresy on salvation, he has a, quote, soul-winning program in which he and other heretical members of his so-called church knock on doors and get people to supposedly believe in Jesus according to the salvation doctrine to which Anderson adheres. These alleged soul-winning encounters might only last a few minutes. But if the person indicates that he, quote, believes on Jesus and shows agreement with Anderson's view of salvation during the encounter, Anderson and his church members consider that person to be saved for all eternity. Now, we're all for evangelism and true soul winning to the true faith of Jesus Christ, but Anderson is definitely not winning any souls by presenting his unbiblical false gospel. I want to focus on a fundamental contradiction that can be detected in Anderson's position and statements on this matter. It is very significant. It further exposes him as a liar and a deceiver, and it proves again that his gospel is false. Anderson frequently opens up his service by counting or tallying up how many souls they have supposedly won and saved during their recent, quote, soul-winning efforts. Listed below, salvations, baptisms, offering totals. Let's go ahead and count up the soul-winning from the past few days. Anything from the 16th? How about Saturday the 17th? Yep, two over here. One more there. Two plus one, all right. And then one more over here. Anything else from Saturday? And then how about today? Do we have a main group total for today? 27. 27 for the big group today, all right. The people he marks down as saved, often after a brief encounter, he considers to be saved forever. For according to him, once a person is saved, there's nothing that person can do to be barred from heaven. Anderson is also emphatic that people should not marry someone who has not already been for sure, quote, saved, and he would not allow any person to have any official position in his church whom he did not deem to be saved. So the first most important criteria of whoever you're going to marry is that they need to be a believer. Yeah. They need to be saved. But you should not begin a relationship or get emotionally involved or start thinking along the lines of being romantic with someone until they are for sure saved. 
As we can see, his belief that it's possible to consider other people as saved, based on their beliefs and profession, is a prominent and integral part of his religion, preaching, and practice. My dad got saved when he was 10 years old. My mom got saved at a similar age. Whole bunch more soul winning went on on Monday. By the end of the day, Monday, our group had had over 100 people saved, you know, because at the end of the day, Sunday, we were up to like 65, and then there were over 50 people saved on Monday. So, you know, that brought it well over 100 people. Now, on March 27th, 2016, Stephen Anderson, quote, ordained Tyler Baker as a, quote, deacon in his church. Baker was the first person Anderson's church ever, quote, ordained as a deacon. Here's what Anderson said about Tyler Baker during the service. But before we go any further, let's bring Brother Tyler Baker up here, and we're going to have him sit up here during the sermon. And so the purpose of this ordination is for us to come together as a church and voice our affirmation that says, yes, we believe in Brother Baker that he meets the qualifications, and that's why he's even up here tonight. If I didn't have faith in him, then he wouldn't be here. As we can see, Anderson has full confidence that Baker is a true believer and has been saved. In fact, considering the people about whose salvation Anderson would be most confident, Baker would be among them, being the first person Anderson's, quote, church ever, quote, ordained, and a man whom Anderson was soon going to send out to start his own church in Florida. Then around the corner this way is Brother Baker's office. He's our deacon, and he's going to be leaving, actually, in just a few months to go start a church in Jacksonville, Florida, uh, the first ser When's the first service? August 6th. August the 6th. He's going to be starting a church in Jacksonville, Florida. During the service, Anderson also stated that he believes Baker will be a great man of God. He laid his hands on Baker, and he prayed that Baker would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And I, be I believe that he will be a great man of God. So let's pray right now. Let's bow our heads together. And Lord, I just pray that you would please just bless Brother Baker tonight, Lord, and fill him with your spirit. And Lord, I just pray that he would do great works for you, that, that many people would be able to see them and glorify you and marvel. Well, a little over a year after Anderson laid his hands on Baker, quote, ordained him as a deacon, and prayed over him that he'd be filled with the Holy Spirit, Anderson fired Baker from his church, Faithful Word Baptist Church. The primary reason for the firing was that Anderson discovered that Baker denies the doctrine of the Trinity. Hey everybody, Pastor Steven Anderson here from Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. I've got some bad news. Tyler Baker has been fired from his job here at Faithful Word Baptist Church. And there are several reasons why, and I'm going to explain all the reasons, but the biggest reason why is that he is believing and spreading a serious heresy in our church. Uh, I found out that he believed this only yesterday around noontime, and I found out he's been spreading it only to certain people. He was very careful who he approached with this false doctrine, and I will have zero fellowship with him ever until he repents of this heresy. Now, the biggest heresy that he's been teaching is he is basically denying the Trinity. He's saying that the Trinity is, quote, borderline polytheism, and he's bought into this oneness Pentecostal doctrine. After he initially fired Baker, Anderson was not sure if Baker is saved. And you say, well, what, what about Tyler Baker? What do you think about Tyler Baker? You know, I'm not saying that he's not saved. I'm not saying that he's a, a false prophet. I am saying that he's lazy, stupid, and arrogant. Now, he may be an unsaved false prophet. I don't know. He may be a Judas Iscariot because this is some pretty weird doctrine. However, a short time later, seeing that Baker was dedicated to his heretical rejection of the Trinity, Anderson concluded that Baker is not saved, which means, according to Anderson, that Baker never actually believed to begin with. I, excuse me. I keep saying Brother Baker. I thought that he was probably saved, and I said on Wednesday night I still thought that he could be saved, but after watching his hour and 18-minute video, I don't believe that he's saved anymore. You know, that was the turning point for me where I believed that he was a total Judas. Anderson apparently feels the same way about various former church members who joined Baker in denying the Trinity. He believed that they were true believers and saved, but now he doesn't think so. Such admissions cannot be underestimated. They are highly significant. Indeed, they cut to the heart of Anderson's false gospel and his false message. They not only prove that Anderson is a total liar, as we will see, 
but they powerfully expose and refute the utter falsity of the unbiblical ideas of faith alone and once saved, always saved. It's also noteworthy that about a year after Anderson publicly, quote, ordained Tyler Baker, laid his hands on him, and specifically prayed that Baker would receive the Holy Spirit and do great things by being filled with the Holy Spirit, Baker did exactly the opposite. Baker became known for rejecting the Holy Spirit by denying the doctrine of the Trinity, one of the fundamental truths of Christianity, which teaches that there is one God in three distinct, co-eternal, co-equal divine persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, etc. And I pray that Brother Baker's preaching would, would be filled with the Spirit, and, and whenever he gets a chance to preach, whether it's behind this pulpit, or whether it's in a jail or a nursing home or at someone's door, Lord, I pray that you would just give him power, Lord, and that you would fill him with your spirit, Lord. Now, this phenomenon of suddenly considering someone not to be saved, whom he previously declared to be a saved believer, is not new to Anderson. In a talk posted a few weeks before he fired Baker, Anderson stated that while you can supposedly be sure of your own salvation, you just can't know if another person is a true believer and saved. Now, when it comes to ourselves, we know whether or not we're saved because we know whether we have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and whether we have fully trusted him for our salvation. But we can't necessarily know that about other people. Did you get that? According to Anderson, we can't know whether someone else is saved. He illustrated his view on that quite dramatically when he completely changed his position on the salvation of Tyler Baker a short time after this talk was posted. In the same talk, Anderson makes his point even more forcefully. You can't know whether another person is saved. And so we have to understand that just because people claim to be saved, it doesn't, yeah, but I knew them and they were saved. You don't know that. You don't know that. You don't know that. You don't know that, Anderson says. So then why does he lie to his audience and constantly tell them this? My dad got saved when he was 10 years old. My mom got saved at a similar age. Whole bunch more soul winning went on on Monday. By the end of the day, Monday, our group had had over 100 people saved, you know, because at the end of the day, Sunday, we were up to like 65. And then there were over 50 people saved on Monday. So, you know, that brought it well over 100 people. Listed below, salvations, baptisms, offering totals. Let's go ahead and count up the soul winning from the past few days. And then one more over here. Anything else from Saturday? And then how about today? Do we have a main group total for today? 27. 27 for the big group today, all right. But you should not begin a relationship or get emotionally involved or start thinking along the lines of being romantic with someone until they are for sure saved. But you know, everybody else is still there. I mean, by the time I left, there were well over 100 people that had already been saved. The man is a liar. Anderson even indicates that there are many people he runs into who, quote, swear up and down that they know they're saved, but they're not. He even says that it's insane to believe people are saved just because they say they are saved. But these people are insane to think that, like, just because somebody says they're saved, we're just supposed to just believe that they're saved. Yet in the same interview, he says this. And uh, we have 11 official soul winning times at our church. People get saved every single day, seven days a week. We have people going out soul winning. Um, we have right now about a couple hundred people getting saved every single week. Anderson is a deceiver. He doesn't know if another person is a true believer and saved, as his own words prove. He didn't even know if Tyler Baker, his first quote deacon, and the man he was going to send out to start his own church, was saved. Anderson now holds that Baker is not saved. He also emphatically states that you can't know if another person is saved. Yeah, but I knew them and they were saved. You don't know that. You don't know that. Yet he constantly stands up and proclaims that thousands of people, including people he might have met only for a few minutes, are saved. He is a lying heretic and a false prophet. Indeed, not only does Anderson contradict himself all the time on this matter, but even within the very same sermon in which he said that you don't know that, you don't know that about whether another person is saved. Yeah, but I knew them and they were saved. You don't know that. You don't know that. In that very sermon, he repeatedly contradicted himself by stating that 90-some percent of his congregation is saved and that you can tell how average Joe is saved. And, you know, I'm not going to preach a salvation message because 90-some percent of us here are, are saved, right? 
So first we just talked about how do we tell if average Joe is saved? Well, we can tell by does he hear God's word? When we show him stuff in the Bible, does he understand what we're saying? Anderson contradicts himself all the time because he is a heretic and his message is a contradictory and demonic lie. The truth is consistent, but a false gospel is not. Anderson's false gospel contradicts scripture and contradicts itself. Anderson's admission that people who outwardly share his beliefs and give all indications to him of being, quote, saved, might not be saved because they have not fully trusted in Jesus, refutes his entire position on salvation. It proves that even according to Anderson, Scripture's statements about believing in Jesus unto salvation presuppose a doctrinal and intellectual fidelity and obedience across a spectrum of theological issues. To believe in Jesus unto salvation requires obedience to his word and consistency with Jesus' teaching across a wide range of issues. Well, if believing in Jesus unto salvation presupposes doctrinal fidelity and obedience to Jesus' teaching across a spectrum of issues, then it can, of course, also presuppose an obedience to Jesus' commands. And that is exactly what we find taught throughout the New Testament. In Matthew 19, we read that Jesus was asked, What must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, quote, If you would enter into life, keep the commandments. End quote. Romans 2, 6-8 He will render to each one according to his works. To those who, with endurance and well-doing, seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. Hebrews 5, 9 He became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. To expand upon how Anderson's statements and contradictions about who is not saved utterly refute his position of faith alone and once saved, always saved, consider the Baptist heretic Sam Gipp. Like Anderson, Sam Gipp believes in faith alone, once saved, always saved, that the King James Bible is inerrant, etc. We have totally exposed and refuted the cultish views of Anderson and Gipp on the King James Bible in our video and article called, Is the King James Bible Infallible? If Anderson were consistent at all, he would say that Sam Gipp should be considered saved, since Gipp professes to be a Baptist who has, quote, believed on Jesus. But even though Gipp fully agrees with Anderson on core salvation doctrines, Anderson proclaims that Gipp is not saved because Gipp teaches falsely on what Anderson deems to be other clear matters in Scripture. Well, I don't even believe for one second that Sam Gipp is even saved. So he's never won anybody to the Lord in his whole life because... Uh, an evil tree cannot bring forth good fruit. Anderson goes further by saying that if other Baptists hear Sam Gipp preach some of his false doctrines and agree with him, or if other Baptist, quote, pastors allow Gipp to preach and defend him, they also are not saved. Sam Gipp is an unsaved, wicked, false prophet, and any pastor who has him come preach after hearing this is just as wicked and demonic as he is because nobody who has the spirit of God living inside of them could listen to that evil, blasphemous doctrine and think that that is acceptable and think that that's okay. You are still in darkness even until now. You are blinded. And this Sam Gipp needs to be canceled from every meeting. And look, if your pastor is having Sam Gipp and you show him this and he's still having Sam Gipp, get out of that church because your pastor is probably just as demonic as he is. Look, and look, if you're watching this video and you just heard what he said and you think it's okay or that there's an excuse for it, you know what? You're not saved. There, I said it. You're not even saved. And if you're watching this video and you think what he said was okay, you're not even saved and I have nothing more to say to you. And you know what? Over the next few months, the pastors who continue to have Sam Gipp come preach and defend him and say, Oh, brother Sam Gipp's being attacked by the devil right now. The, the, all, all it's showing is just that they're not saved. They're just saying we're not saved. Allowing someone to preach and defending someone are actions. They are works. These statements prove that Anderson incorporates a person's actions and works into his analysis of whether that person is saved. That contradicts and refutes his position of faith alone and once saved, always saved. Anderson also says that if anyone follows an antichrist, he is not saved. But if somebody starts following an antichrist, then that shows us that that person was never saved in the first place. Right. Following someone is an action. This proves that Anderson incorporates a person's actions into his analysis of whether that person is saved. That refutes his position on salvation. 
False teachers will always contradict themselves on faith alone and once saved, always saved, because their doctrine is totally unbiblical and patently contrary to common sense. Anderson also says that if people don't want to hear the word of God, and if they, quote, flock to false teachers, they are not saved. And when Bible-believing, saved preachers are getting up and preaching the word of God, and they hate it and don't want to hear it, and then they flock to false teachers, what does that tell you? It tells you that they're not saved. They love the stranger, and they flee the true man of God, the true servant of God. They love him. They love his preaching because they're not saved because they're not saved. So don't tell me, well, but yeah, but on March whatever the date, Sam Gibb kneeled down and asked, it. not everybody who says, Lord, Lord, is saved. So believing in Jesus unto salvation includes not just comprehending the word, but savoring the word, wanting to hear it, and choosing to flock to those who teach it correctly. This once again proves that even Anderson incorporates a person's actions into his analysis of whether that person is saved. It refutes his position on salvation. Also note that when Anderson says, So don't tell me, well, but yeah, but on March whatever the date, Sam Gibb kneeled down and asked, it. not everybody who says Lord, Lord is saved. That's right. He doesn't quote the rest of the verse after the words, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. The rest of the verse says, quote, but the one doing the will of my Father who is in heaven, end quote. According to Jesus Christ, to enter the kingdom of heaven, one must be doing the will of the Father. Thus, salvation is not by faith alone. Also note that the word here translated as doing is a present participle. It signifies an ongoing action. Those who will enter heaven are those who believe and are doing the will of God. Either a quote believer can do anything and be saved, or he can't. Anderson's admission, which of course contradicts other statements that he makes, that a person cannot believe and do anything and be considered a truly saved believer, proves that believing in Jesus unto salvation in Scripture presupposes obedience to Jesus' word and consistency with Jesus' precepts in a variety of areas. If that's true in doctrinal matters, then it's true in moral matters as well, which is exactly what the New Testament teaches. For instance, someone might say, but following and flocking to an antichrist who teaches heresies is inconsistent with the word of God. Yes, but so is fornication. So is adultery. The Bible is quite clear that fornication and adultery are forbidden. It also teaches that fornication and adultery bar people from heaven. Let me say this. Adultery and fornication are major sins that God condemns throughout the New Testament. In fact, he seems to bring them up more than other sins. It's just, it's just over and over and over and over again. Yet Anderson says that people who engage in fornication and adultery against the word of God can still be saved believers. If, quote, true believers can act in a manner that's not consistent with the word of God by fornicating and remain saved, then, quote, true believers could act in a manner that's not consistent with the word of God in other ways and be saved such as by following false teachers, giving them a platform, joining a false church, embracing a heresy, etc. But Anderson holds that if you deny certain doctrines or join certain religions, you were never saved. That refutes his false position of faith alone and once saved, always saved. You're not always going to do what's right, and you will be led astray on things that aren't as clear. But you're never going to walk out and say, oh, turns out Jesus is the wrong name. No, I, I won't believe it any more than I would believe somebody could walk out of here and join the Orthodox Church or the Catholic Church or the Mormon Church and still be saved. Right. Now, could a person walk out of here and, and go join the non-denominational fund center and be saved? Absolutely. There's no doctrine even being preached down there. <laughs> There's neither the voice of the stranger or the voice of the shepherd down there. It's just a rock band and a motivational speaker. Yeah. But they're not going to go down and start going like this and 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 and... Forgive me, Father, for I've sinned. It's been X amount of time since my last confession. Not going to happen. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Now, we might find them drunk in the gutter. All of this contradicts Anderson's claim that once someone, quote, believes, he can then do anything and still be saved. There's nothing I can do to go to hell because I'm saved. It also proves that even according to Anderson, obedience and conduct consistent with God's word is required for salvation and that refutes his entire position on salvation.
It's also interesting that Anderson says that fornication is a very serious sin, and that according to the Bible, it can and should get a believer thrown out of the church. Now, let me say this about fornication. You know, it's a very serious sin in so much that the Bible even says that it can get you thrown out of the local church. 1 Corinthians 5 uh, reveals that those who are in fornication should be uh, thrown out of the church. I mean, it's a major, major sin. So fornication should get a believer thrown out of the church, but if that person dies, he will be ushered into heaven. Thrown out of church, but ushered into the glory of heaven, even though scripture explicitly teaches that fornicators are barred from heaven. What a heretical fool. We've proven by Anderson's own admissions and scripture's clear teaching that believing in Jesus unto salvation presupposes obedience to Jesus' word and consistency with Jesus' precepts. This applies to moral and doctrinal matters. It involves avoiding grave sins as the Bible directly teaches. Here are just a few more verses to prove the point about what faith in Jesus unto salvation means in the New Testament. In John 3.16, we read that whoever believes in Jesus should not perish but have eternal life. But if you just keep reading in that chapter, you discover in John 3.36 that to have eternal life through faith in Jesus, you must also obey him. Quote, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, and he who disobeys the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. End quote. Disobeys is a proper translation of John 3.36. We find the same thing in John 8:51. Quote, "Amen, amen, I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he will never see death." End quote. To be saved through faith in Jesus, one must also keep his word. One must obey him. John 5:28-29, quote, "Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment." End quote. As we can see, Jesus teaches that those who do evil will be condemned. This refutes faith alone. The gospel teaches that to be saved through faith in Jesus requires living in a manner that's good and not doing what is evil. We see the same truth throughout the New Testament and in the book of Romans. In Romans 10.9, referring to the ongoing confession of believers who have already been justified through baptism, we read this, quote, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. St. Paul is referring to those who have already been justified, see Romans 5.1, and are living properly. You just need to keep reading to see that salvation by this faith and confession requires that a person continue in goodness. Romans 11.21-22, For if God did not spare the natural branches, neither will he spare you. Note then the goodness and the severity of God, severity toward those who have fallen, but God's goodness toward you, if you continue in his goodness. Otherwise, you too will be cut off, end quote. This totally refutes faith alone and once saved, always saved. Also, there were no chapter divisions when St. Paul wrote Romans. Romans 11 is part of the same message as Romans 10. You can't separate them. Indeed, St. Paul teaches the same truth throughout the book of Romans. We already looked at Romans 2, 6-8, quote, He will render to each one according to his works, to those who with endurance and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. There is also Romans 2, 13, quote, For it is not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. Romans 6, 16, Obedience which leads to justice. Romans 8, 12-13, So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Notice that St. Paul here clearly teaches the same truth. Committing sins of the flesh will lead to spiritual death. In Romans 8, 16-17, we also read that people will only be glorified with Christ if they suffer with him. All of these verses refute the heresies of faith alone and once saved, always saved. They prove that believing in Jesus unto salvation in the New Testament involves obeying Jesus' commands and avoiding grave sins. Like so many heretics in history, the non-Christian Stephen Anderson and his heretical followers have totally blundered on this matter and misunderstood the teaching of Scripture. They have wrongly concluded that statements in the New Testament about being saved by faith in Jesus mean that obedience to Jesus is not required and that grave sins don't need to be avoided so that one could even fornicate, commit adultery, commit murder, etc. and be saved. But first I just want to drive this in that works are not required for salvation, nor are works the evidence of salvation. The Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life.
They are totally wrong and totally deceived. They have abused Scripture's teaching and constructed an entirely false gospel in the process, one that is demolished by the Word of God and completely exposed by their own contradictions and admissions, as we've seen. My dad got saved when he was 10 years old. My mom got saved at a similar age. Yeah, but I knew them and they were saved. You don't know that. You don't know that. Heretics such as Anderson make a similarly fatal mistake when they misunderstand verses in Romans and Galatians about how justification is not by works of the law or for the one that works. Some also abuse Philippians 3.9, which refers to not having a righteousness which comes from the law, but through the faith of Jesus. They think that those passages teach that no sin or human action could have any bearing whatsoever on one's justification or salvation. That is disastrously wrong. As the context clearly demonstrates, those verses refer to how no one is justified by circumcision and the works of the old law, which is sometimes just called the law, or by works done outside of grace. For example, circumcision is mentioned 13 times in Romans chapters 3 and 4 alone. Circumcision and the old law are also under discussion in Galatians 2, Galatians 5, and Philippians 3. Those passages teach that justification and salvation come through Jesus and his faith, not through the Mosaic Law, or through any work done outside of the faith and grace of Jesus Christ. Those passages have nothing to do with the ongoing obedience and proper living required for a Christian to maintain justification and be saved, as the entire New Testament makes clear. That's why, as we've seen, the book of Romans itself contains numerous passages which teach that people will be lost for grave sins and disobedience. In fact, Romans contains some of the strongest and clearest passages in the New Testament against the ideas of faith alone and once saved, always saved. The same is true of the book of Galatians. We already looked at Galatians 5, 19-21, which demolishes faith alone and once saved, always saved. In Galatians 6, St. Paul again warns the true believers who have put on Christ that God is not mocked and that they will only reap eternal life if they live in the proper way. Quote, do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. End quote. The colossal error of Anderson and other heretics on quote, works of the law is further refuted by 1 Corinthians 7.19 considered in conjunction with Galatians 5.6. In Galatians 5.6, we read, quote, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails for anything, but faith working through love, end quote. Notice here that it's not faith alone, but a faith working through love that avails. To be saved, one must have a faith working through love. That further refutes faith alone. What St. Paul is teaching here is that circumcision is not required for salvation, but faith working through love is. To make the point St. Paul puts faith in opposition to, or on the other side of, circumcision and uncircumcision in regard to what avails or counts. Well, in 1 Corinthians 7.19, St. Paul uses a similar expression, but watch what he does. 1 Corinthians 7.19, quote, For circumcision is nothing, and uncircumcision is nothing, but keeping the commandments of God, end quote. Here St. Paul contrasts circumcision and uncircumcision not with faith, but instead with keeping the commandments of God. Thus, keeping the commandments of God is in the same category with faith working through love in opposition to circumcision. This demonstrates that according to St. Paul, circumcision isn't required for salvation, but keeping the commandments of God is, just as faith working through love is. This further refutes the Protestants' misunderstanding of this matter. If Protestants were correct about the meaning of St. Paul and works of the law, and they definitely aren't, then St. Paul would have put keeping the commandments of God on the left side with circumcision as what doesn't matter or is nothing in salvation. But he doesn't. He puts keeping the commandments of God in opposition to circumcision, just as he did with faith, to indicate what does matter and is required for salvation. This verse further demonstrates that keeping the commandments of God, avoiding grave sins, etc., is not what St. Paul refers to when he teaches that justification is through faith apart from works of the law in Romans and Galatians. Apart from works of the law or the law means one is saved through the faith of Jesus Christ apart from circumcision and all the ceremonies of the Mosaic law. There's a reason that in 2 Peter 3, 15-16, St. Peter warns that there are things in St. Paul's epistles that are, quote, hard to understand, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. The self-refuting and contradictory false gospel of the non-Christian Stephen Anderson and similar heretics is a prime example of how heretics twist the epistles of St. Paul to their destruction. 
Heretics such as Anderson also abuse verses in Ephesians 2 and Titus 3 on being saved through faith and regeneration, not of works. They think that such passages teach that no sin or human action could have any bearing whatsoever on one's justification and salvation. But again, they are disastrously wrong. As we've covered in detail elsewhere, Ephesians 2 and Titus 3 refer to the grace of regeneration which comes in the sacrament of baptism. To discover that being saved through the faith in Ephesians 2, 8-9, and being saved through the washing of regeneration in Titus 3, 5, refers to being baptized, just consult Galatians 3, 26-27 and Colossians 2, 12, which both refer to the initial act of forgiveness and make it clear that it comes through baptism. Galatians 3 directly teaches that one becomes a son of God through the faith by being baptized. An adult also, of course, must assent to the truth of the gospel. But the entrance into Christ and the becoming a son of God through the faith happens in baptism. Galatians 3, 26-27 and Colossians 2, 12 are parallel to Ephesians 2, 8-9 in content and description. And like Titus 3, 5, they are referring to the reception of regeneration or initial forgiveness by being baptized into Christ. Being baptized into Christ is described as being saved through the faith in Ephesians 2, 8-9, and being saved through the washing of regeneration in Titus 3, 5, because baptism is how one enters the faith of Jesus Christ and receives regeneration, as the New Testament clearly teaches and the entire ancient Christian church recognized. That's also why 1 Peter 3.21 teaches that baptism now saves us. And Jesus declared that unless a man is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. It's also very interesting that the word for washing, as in the washing of regeneration in Titus 3.5, is the Greek word lutru, the genitive form of lutron. In the entire New Testament, that word is only used here in Titus 3.5 and in Ephesians 5.26. Ephesians 5.26 refers to the church having been cleansed by the washing of water by the word, and it uses lutro, the dative form of lutron. The connection between regeneration and water, which Jesus Christ himself makes in John 3.5 and is present in the New Testament, is once again seen here. Ephesians 5.26 uses the word for washing that's only also used in Titus 3.5 about the washing of regeneration and connects it with water, precisely because the washing of regeneration mentioned in Titus 3.5 comes through the water of baptism when the baptismal word or formula is pronounced. Notice that in this clip, the non-Christian false prophet Stephen Anderson once again teaches exactly the opposite of the Bible when he states that baptism does not save you. Because baptism does not save you. The anti-apostle Anderson also proclaims that baptism has nothing to do with salvation. Baptism has nothing to do with salvation. What a truly absurd and ridiculous statement. The fact that baptism regenerates and is necessary for salvation, it's how one puts on Christ, enters the church, etc., is taught throughout the New Testament and was recognized by the entire ancient Christian church as being the obvious teaching of the New Testament. For more on that, see our video, Cornelius, the Gift of Languages, and the Necessity of Baptism. Anderson is an unbelievable heretic. Anderson's false gospel is also totally condemned by Acts 2.38, which directly teaches that baptism is for the remission of sins. Heretics like Anderson simply reject that teaching of the Bible and so many others. Regeneration through the sacrament of baptism, which is how one enters the faith of Jesus Christ and is initially saved or forgiven, is not man's work. That's why Ephesians 2, 8-9 and Titus 3, 5 refer to the reception of that grace of regeneration in baptism as not of works. It's the work of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. Those verses have nothing to do with the ongoing obedience and proper living required for a Christian to maintain justification and ultimately be saved, as the entire New Testament makes clear. That's why the book of Ephesians itself in chapter 5 goes on to demolish faith alone and once saved always saved by directly warning those who are now light in the Lord that grave sins bar people from the kingdom of God. Also notice that in this clip, Anderson not only teaches exactly the opposite of the Bible on drunkards, fornicators, adulterers, and murderers being barred from heaven, but he specifically states that you can return to your old ways of sin and still be saved. I believe it's possible for a saved person to become a drunkard. I believe it's possible for a saved person to become a fornicator, an adultery, even a, a, an adulterer, even a murderer. Okay, I believe it's possible for a saved person to return to their old sins and, and go back to the old way of life. 
The Bible teaches exactly the opposite in Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 10, 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22, etc. The devil is speaking right through the non-Christian, anti-biblical, false prophet Stephen Anderson. It's also interesting that Anderson condemns the notion that one must repent of his sins to be saved. He thinks that's a heresy because it contradicts faith alone. I get so sick of this repent of your sins garbage coming from Baptist preachers. Right. Repenting of your sins is works. And that's all this repent of your sins thing is. It's turn over a new leaf and thou shalt be saved. Go through a 12-step program and thou shalt be saved. That is works salvation. Is there a great falling away happening? Well, you better believe it when even the independent fundamental Baptist that we grew up with that taught us salvation by faith alone are now getting into this repent of your sins salvation. Yet we already saw how Anderson said that he would have no fellowship ever with someone who did not repent of his heresy. And I will have zero fellowship with him ever until he repents of this heresy. So Anderson will eternally reject fellowship with someone unless he repents. But he says that to say repentance is necessary for eternal fellowship with God is a wicked heresy. What a heretical fool. Anderson also likes to say that getting to heaven is not based on how good you are. You know, the Bible is really clear on salvation. It's not based on how good you are. According to him, you don't need goodness, just faith. But that's totally false. The Bible teaches that you need goodness or righteousness to be saved. Yes, you need faith. The one true faith of Jesus Christ is absolutely necessary. It's the root of all justification. But you also need sanctification. You need faith plus sanctification, faith plus holiness, faith plus righteousness. Here are just a few verses to prove that Anderson preaches a false gospel when he says that you don't need righteousness, sanctification, and goodness to be saved. 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Notice, if you are not righteous, you will not get to heaven. 2 Thessalonians 2, 13. God chose you as the first fruits unto salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. Notice, salvation is not just by belief in the truth, but also through sanctification by the Spirit. You need both. This refutes Anderson. We also know from the New Testament's teaching on being born again that this sanctification which comes from God and is a result of His grace internally transforms the believer and resides within him. He is a new man. Since the act which makes him a new man, that is, spiritual rebirth, is what gives him access to the kingdom of God, it is that act which justifies him. That proves that regeneration justifies. That demonstrates that the sanctification, righteousness, or holiness needed to be saved exists or resides within the person, within the new man. Since it exists within the new man, even though it's the result of God's transforming gift and grace, it can be impacted by a person's actions, choices, and sins, as the New Testament clearly teaches. For more on this, see our documentary called Protestantism's Big Justification Lie. Also, the fact that one must be born again to be saved, as everyone admits, refutes faith alone, because regeneration or being born again is not faith. They are distinct. But you need both to be saved, which proves that faith alone is a false gospel. For more on that, see our video, Born Again Refutes Faith Alone. Matthew 5.20, Jesus said, For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Notice again, you need righteousness to be saved. Matthew 25.46, And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. 1 Timothy 2.15, Yet she will be saved through childbearing, if they continue in faith and love and holiness with sobriety. Notice, you need holiness to be saved. 2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Matthew 16.27, He will render to every person according to his works. Revelation 20.12-13, And I saw the dead, small and great, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books, according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. Hebrews 12.14 Pursue peace with all men and holiness, without which no one shall see the Lord. Notice, no one shall see the Lord without holiness. These and many other verses prove that salvation is not by faith alone. 
In addition to the true faith, you need righteousness, you need sanctification, you need holiness. So the next time you hear Anderson or another heretic say that salvation is not based on how good you are, know that he is lying. He is denying the teaching of the Bible. Considering that no one sees the Lord without holiness, and nothing defiled shall enter heaven, Anderson must believe in an instantaneous kind of purgatory after death for all the unholy and unrighteous fornicators he believes are saved. In true and biblical Catholic teaching, however, no one who dies in mortal sin gets to purgatory. They go to hell, where Stephen Anderson is without any doubt headed. It's also interesting that Anderson lies and proclaims that the Bible says we are saved by faith alone, when the Bible teaches exactly the opposite in James 2.24. It's just another example of how Anderson preaches precisely the opposite of the Bible. But the Bible says we're saved by faith alone. Let's now consider some other revealing statements and actions of Stephen Anderson. In a film he was involved with called Marching to Zion, Anderson interviewed various Jewish rabbis. His goal was to expose Judaism, and there's a lot of truth in the film. However, when interviewing an Antichrist rabbi for the video, Anderson basically denied Christianity by nodding his head in agreement and saying, uh-huh, as the rabbi was attacking Christianity. The church fathers blame the Jews for the death of Jesus, and that is Paul's doing. It was Paul's doing in the epistle to the Thessalonians, chapter 2, mm. verse 14 and 15. This has poisoned the mind of generations of Christians, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? So 1 Thessalonians this is Paul. 2, okay. To this day, 26% of all Americans believe that Jews were responsible in the death of Jesus because people are so gullible. It portrays the Jews as evil people. Oh, okay. Which is nonsense. Jews believed it, and they still do today. It's not acceptable to manifest agreement with someone's attacks on Christianity just to get a revealing interview. It's another example of how Anderson is of the devil. Anderson also rightly holds that the Jews are not the chosen people of God in the New Testament. He also correctly states that the Jerusalem temple was destroyed in AD 70 and no longer has any relevance in the Christian period. It has no relevance because Christianity and the church have replaced Judaism, and Judaism since the promulgation of the gospel is a false religion. The issue that I have with celebrating that is that that physical building is completely irrelevant in the New Testament. That physical building of the temple has become completely irrelevant. In fact, it's been leveled to the ground. And God, would, you know why God allowed that temple to be destroyed? Just to show them, you're done. It's done. So why would we replace a celebration of the birth of Christ with a celebration of a building that has no relevance? None. However, Anderson totally contradicts himself on this issue when he expresses his view that the end times temple of God mentioned in 2 Thessalonians 2.4 will be a rebuilt Jewish temple in Jerusalem. The temple will be rebuilt in the future. And what's going to happen is they're going to rebuild the temple and they're going to reinstitute the daily morning and evening sacrifice at the temple. That's a stunning contradiction. That physical building is completely irrelevant in the New Testament. That physical building of the temple has become completely irrelevant with a celebration of a building that has no relevance, none. It's an example of how Anderson, being a non-Christian heretic, is wrong on the end times, just as he is completely wrong on so many other aspects of Christianity and the Bible. The temple of God mentioned in the prophecy of 2 Thessalonians 2.4 has nothing to do with Judaism or its defunct rites. The temple of God mentioned in end times prophecy is not a rebuilt temple of Jerusalem or a Jewish temple, for that would not be the temple of God at all, but the temple of a false religion. Rather, the temple of God mentioned in New Testament end times prophecy is St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican. This is covered in detail in our videos called The Temple of God in Prophecy is Not Jewish and the exact location of the end times temple of God. End times prophecies have been fulfilled at that very spot, St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, in our day in stunning detail as our material covers. It was from that temple and the Vatican that events occurred which led to the taking away and removal of the sacrifice of the Mass from most of the world and its replacement with the abominable new Mass during the prophesied post-Vatican II apostasy. 
The temple of God in the end times has nothing to do with Judaism, but everything to do with Catholicism. That's because the Catholic faith is the one true faith of Jesus Christ, outside of which there is no salvation. There is no building in Protestantism that could possibly be considered a universal temple. But there is such a building in Catholicism, St. Peter's Basilica in the Vatican, built on the very tomb of St. Peter, the Prince of the Apostles, the one to whom Jesus Christ entrusted his entire flock and gave the keys to the kingdom of heaven. St. Peter's Basilica has also officially been called the Temple. It is the Temple of God, and prophecies have been fulfilled there in our day as our material shows. Catholicism has the Temple of God because Catholicism is true and biblical Christianity, while Protestantism is not. It's also interesting that in this clip, Anderson speaks about an unsaved person and points directly and forcefully to himself. It's not possible for an unsaved person to win someone to Christ. That gesture expresses the reality, for Anderson is definitely not on the path to salvation, but on the path to damnation. Stephen Anderson also teaches that the Bible is God. Really, he actually teaches that the King James Bible is God himself. Let me say something to you tonight, and you know what? A lot of people don't like this, but I have no fear of this. People have left our church because of this. They said I was a heretic because I don't care what they say. I have no fear of man. Hey, let me say to you tonight, behold your God. This is God. Let me introduce you to God. It's the Bible. You say, oh, man. You're an idolater. Hey, I'm not worshiping a physical book. I'm not, this physical book is, look, look, see, nothing. It's a book. But you know what? Those words are God. Believe it or not. You call me a heretic, call me whatever you want. I will preach that until I'm breathing my last breath. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And it still is God, my friend. The Word is God. So I'm saying to you tonight, hey, meet God. You know, Faith Word Baptist Church, God. God, Faith Word Baptist, I'm making an introduction here. That is total and complete idolatry as well as another shocking contradiction. The Bible is not God. It is a collection of inerrant writings inspired by God, which contain a true history of salvation, revelation about him, etc. Anderson, being an unbeliever who rejects the faith of Jesus Christ, has confused the eternal, uncreated Word of God, John 1.1, 1, 1, the Son of God, with writings that came into existence in time through the hands and minds of men acting under the inspiration of God the Holy Spirit. Words spoken and written by men, even if dictated or inspired by God, are part of the created order. The eternal Word, the Son of God, is uncreated, when scripture is called God's word, it refers to revelation from God to man in words God inspired men to write. That word of God is not God the word, the son of God. God the word is personal, he is infinite, and he became flesh. The words of the Bible are not personal, you would not pray to them, they are not infinite, and they did not become flesh. The Bible and the words which God inspired men to write in it are not God. They are created things used by God in a powerful way. Anderson's outrageous heresy and blasphemy demonstrates that he doesn't believe in the true God. His position is idolatry and a form of pantheism. The truth is that God is distinct in essence and reality from the world, and that he is above everything which exists or is conceivable except himself. Since God inspired the human writers of the Bible, true Christians correctly say that God is the author of sacred scripture, not that he is sacred scripture. But Stephen Anderson clearly worships a false god. Anderson also totally contradicts himself when he blasphemously holds up the King James Bible and proclaims, Behold your God, and then proceeds to drop it like a piece of trash and proclaim that he's not worshiping a book, but only the words contained in it. Hey, let me say to you tonight, Behold your God. This is God. Let me introduce you to God. It's the Bible. I say, oh, man, you're an idolater. Hey, I'm not worshiping a physical book. I'm not, this physical book is, look, look, see, nothing. It's a book. But you know what? Those words are God. So I'm saying to you tonight, hey, meet God. You know, Faith Word Baptist Church, God. God, Faith Word Baptist, I'm making an introduction here. That's a total contradiction in addition to idolatry. When you hold up a book and you say, behold your God, and then you say, meet God, while introducing people to the book, you are clearly identifying that book, a copy of the King James Bible, as God and worshiping it. Anderson is an idolatrous and contradictory non-Christian. It's ironic that this idolatrous non-Christian pagan Stephen Anderson, who openly worships a copy of the King James Bible as his false god,
falsely accuses the one true church of Jesus Christ, the Catholic Church, of being idolatrous and satanic. You guys are a bunch of idolatrous pagans, and we're Christians. Everybody in here supposedly understands that the, the Catholic Church is an abomination. The Roman Catholic Church is not Christian whatsoever. The church is satanic. The Roman church, that is. That's, that's part of being a Baptist. It's too bad the Catholics won't be able to apologize to Simon when they get to heaven since they're all going to hell. Amen. No, the Catholic Church is not idolatrous or satanic or false, but tools of Satan who don't understand Christianity, like Anderson, hate the Catholic Church and lash out against it because it's the one true church founded by Jesus Christ upon St. Peter, and it represents the authority of the true God and Jesus Christ whom they reject and despise. Anderson also totally lies about the Catholic Church when he says that millions of people were tortured and murdered by the Inquisition. What they did during the Inquisition. Now, I'm telling you, it is the most hair-raising, evil, satanic, just disgusting actions that people have committed in the history of mankind. The barbarity, the cruelty, the sadistic, wickedness of the Roman Catholic Church is just beyond comprehension. The Catholic Church torturing and murdering millions of people. And that's what I'm going to get into tonight. The millions of people tortured and killed by the Catholic Church. This is pure mythology, absolute nonsense. Various experts on the subject, including non-Catholics, have been cited to debunk these lies. For example, the Spanish Inquisition is considered by many anti-Catholics to be the quote most notorious of the inquisitorial tribunals. An examination of documentation about the Spanish Inquisition indicates that during its entire existence, a total of about 3,000 people were executed. A higher-end estimate would be about 5,000 people, but the number is probably about 3,000. This is based on the best available documentation. You can see this range reflected in the entry on the Spanish Inquisition in the New World Encyclopedia, as well as in numerous books dealing with the topic. Quote, between 3,000 to 5,000 people died during the Inquisition's 350 years, end quote. The Spanish Inquisition lasted for almost 356 years from November 1478 to July 1834. 3,000 people executed over a period of 356 years is about 8 people a year. 5,000 people executed over that period would be about 14 people a year. By comparison, in the United States last year, 20 people were executed for a crime, and in 1999 alone, 98 people were executed. The number of those executed as a result of the Spanish Inquisition was far smaller than in comparable secular courts. Moreover, various countries executed people for religious reasons during this period. The Inquisition, which was an ecclesiastical court or tribunal charged with investigating heresy, at a time when heresy was a serious crime in numerous countries, was on the whole quite fair, although it was not perfect. The aforementioned statistics about the number of those executed during the existence of the Spanish Inquisition are based on actual records of the Inquisition, which scholars in the field have been able to access. As a court, the Inquisition kept records. From available files, scholars have been able to form a factually based view of the overall number of people involved. These facts have demolished popular legends about the Inquisition. It may be true that about 99% of what many people believe about the Spanish Inquisition is false. Legends about the Inquisition, such as the ridiculous mythology that Anderson promotes, arose for theological reasons. Non-Catholic sects are fueled not only by false doctrines, but very often by lies about history. It's one of the ways the devil keeps their members under the influence of false teachers and from seeking out the truth and coming to a knowledge of it. Anderson's utterly ridiculous statement about the Inquisition, which is totally debunked by actual documentation and experts on the subject, is a case in point. Connected to Anderson's open worship of the King James Bible, he holds that the King James Version, an English translation published in the 17th century, is perfect, inspired, and without error. Let me just start out by saying that I believe that the English King James Bible is the Word of God without error. I believe that it is a perfectly accurate translation. You got the perfect Word of God right here, the King James. This is all you need. There is no warrant or basis whatsoever in Scripture or in Christian revelation to believe that an English translation done by Anglicans in 17th century England would be singularly guaranteed perfection and infallibility of all the translations of the Bible attempted and done in history. 
The people who have adopted this position are acting irrationally and in a manner that contradicts Christ's revelation. They have taken this absurd position because they have resisted and rejected the true sources of revelation, scripture, and apostolic tradition, and the true church which preserves God's word and teaching, the traditional Catholic church. Having rejected the true Christ, the true church, and the true revelation of God, they are moved to place their confidence in a false God and a false source that has no guarantee from Christ to be perfect and without error. They are attracted to strange voices, in other words. It's no different from Mormons who declare that Joseph Smith is their, quote, prophet, and place complete trust in his false revelations. That's why we pointed out in our article and video on this matter, which goes into much detail on the topic, that King James onlyists like Anderson have made the King James Bible their false Christ. A striking illustration that we are correct is found in Stephen Anderson's open declaration that the King James Bible is his, quote, God. Hey, let me say to you tonight, behold your God. This is God. Let me introduce you to God. It's the Bible. So I'm saying to you tonight, hey, meet God. Their disastrous error is connected to the false doctrine of sola scriptura, since they wrongly believe that God's word is only preserved in the written word, and not also in the apostolic tradition and the church's teaching. They believe they must have a Bible translation in English that perfectly preserves God's word. Hence, they have wrongly declared the King James to be that translation. They don't understand how and where God's word is preserved because, sadly, they aren't truly Christian. Here is Stephen Anderson's former deacon, Tyler Baker, expressing their absurd view that the King James Bible is inspired and inerrant, like the actual scriptures. I quickly uh, want to go through just, just general things that I believe, just kind of my statement of faith uh, in general. Not an all-inclusive list, uh, but this is just my general uh, statement of faith for myself personally. I believe in the King James Bible. I believe that the King James Bible is perfect. It's inspired. It's inerrant. I believe that it was preserved unto us. It's exactly what they had in the original manuscripts and that there are zero errors in the King James Bible. To further illustrate the cultic irrationality at the heart of King James Onlyism, consider that Stephen Anderson and other King James Onlyists hold that other translations of the Bible, including other English translations that came before the King James, are not perfect, inspired, and without error. The douay Reims Bible was a Catholic translation published in 1609, two years before the King James translation was published in 1611. There were also Protestant translations that came out before the King James, including the Great Bible, the Geneva Bible, and the Bishop's Bible, despite what Anderson wrongly says in this clip. This Bible that the pastor to my left has is not a real Bible. Okay. It's a new translation that takes out entire verses. Listen. I have the King James Bible, the original English Listen. Bible. No, as we've seen, the King James Version was not the original English Bible, even from a Protestant or non-Catholic perspective. The Latin Vulgate was also used for much longer than the King James Bible. Nevertheless, Anderson and King James Onlyus believe that the translations that came before the King James Version, including Protestant ones, were not perfect. Well, if they were not perfect, then the King James translation could be less than perfect as well. The King James Bible wasn't even the first Bible authorized by an English sovereign. The Great Bible and the Bishop's Bible were authorized by an English sovereign before the 1611 King James Version. If those Bibles could be flawed, then so could the King James Version. And even if the King James Version had been the first and only authorized English Bible, what relevance would that have to being guaranteed perfection in the work of Bible translation? None. The King James Translation is in fact demonstrably flawed and wrong in various places. This is why Anderson tells people not to consult the original Greek of the New Testament and the Hebrew of the Old Testament, and that the final authority for his, quote, church is not the original languages in which the Bible was written, but the King James translation. We believe that the King James Bible is the word of God and why the final authority in this church for all matters of faith and practice is an English King James Bible, not a Greek New Testament and not a Hebrew Old Testament. And listen, if anybody starts going back to the Greek to make their point, just zone out. That is simply to say that one should not consult the language and writing in which Revelation was actually inspired, but only listen to the false god he has established for himself, the King James Version. Stephen Anderson also says that the Textus Receptus, that is, the name given to the Greek New Testament texts from which the King James Version of the New Testament was translated, is the majority text. 
we still can look at the majority text. We can still look at the vast majority of evidence, what's known as the textus receptus or the received texts of the original Greek and Hebrew. And when we see that they're all saying the same thing, we're going to go with that majority received text, not with the outlier. However, that is wrong. The textus receptus is not the majority text. Although they are closely related, the Textus Receptus, or TR, is different from the majority text in over 1,000 places. To give just three examples of differences, although as I said, over 1,000 could be given, at the end of Hebrews 2.7, the TR has the words, and set him over the works of your hands, but the majority text does not. In Matthew 10.8, the TR has the words, raise the dead, but the majority text does not. And in Acts 8.37, a verse frequently cited by Baptists, the TR has words spoken by Philip and the eunuch, while these words are not in the majority text. In fact, not only are King James only is wrong when they say that the TR is the majority text. We still can look at the majority text. We can still look at the vast majority of evidence, what's known as the textus receptus or the received texts of the original Greek and Hebrew. But many of them don't realize that the 1611 King James Version was translated from various sources, including different versions of the TR. Where versions of the TR differed, the translator simply picked which Greek reading to use for translation. Moreover, in Revelation 16.5, the reading of the King James which says, quote, and shalt be, instead of, quote, O Holy One, is not supported by any Greek manuscript or the Latin Vulgate. The King James Version says, and shalt be, instead of what all Greek manuscripts say, because John Calvin's successor, Theodore Beza, who edited and published various editions of the TR, thought that's what it says, and it found its way into the King James Version. The position of King James only is like Anderson is baseless, illogical, and anti-Christian, but when Anderson and others attempt to explain it, they sometimes like to stress how learned the King James translators were. And you think that you know more than the 54 expert scholars who spent seven years translating this book. So his confidence in the King James translation is based on his faith in men, men who had no guarantee of inerrancy from Jesus Christ. It's a faith of man, not of God. The King James translators were Anglicans, some of whom believed in the baptism of infants. Stephen Anderson holds that anyone who believes in baptizing babies is part of a false religion and is in darkness. You know what? That's not bap You were not baptized as a baby. You were sprinkled in a false, wicked religion that's teaching you lies. And let me tell you something. Any religion that baptizes babies is teaching lies. Therefore, when you see someone teaching that baptism is by sprinkling or pouring or baptizing babies, that person isn't even a babe in Christ. They're just simply not in Christ. Right. Because no one who's in Christ has that much darkness over their mind when they read the Bible. He's quite wrong on that matter. But just consider how absurd this is. Anderson believes that many of the Anglican translators of the King James Bible were not even Christian. According to him, they adhered to a wicked false religion, and they were in darkness. But at the same time, he holds that they were part of a team which uniquely produced the only perfect translation of the Bible, and a work that should be used as the final authority on all matters of faith rather than the original languages. What cultic nonsense. And here's another point that King James Onlyus, like Anderson, don't get. It is this. Even if you have the greatest language expert in the world translating from one language to another, words have what is called a semantic range. That means that a word in a language, for example Greek, often bears a variety of potential meanings depending upon the context. So even if a translator from Greek to English knows all the possible meanings of that word better than someone else, when he translates he still must make a choice about what the Greek author meant. That choice about what the author was really teaching or saying will determine which of the potential meanings to choose. The translator must interpret the passage, in other words. That's why every translation involves some level of interpretation. It's also why the most powerful arguments about what the New Testament writers said are sometimes made by showing how the New Testament itself uses words in the original language. When that is done, a person cites the New Testament itself as his Greek authority by showing how the inspired Greek text uses the same word, the same verb, etc. Now in many cases what a biblical author is saying is obvious, and or a word's semantic range is limited. That's one reason that the proper translation of many passages is obvious and indisputable. But in other cases it's not as clear what the precise translation should be because there are more subtle potential meanings of the words involved, and the author's intentions aren't as obvious. In those cases a more involved analysis and a better understanding of what the author was teaching or conveying is necessary.
Thus, one's knowledge about the language, no matter how great, doesn't guarantee that one's translation will be correct, because an expert in the language could fail to perceive the thrust and intention of the author in context, even if he knows all the potential definitions of the words involved. To convey with 100% accuracy the author's meaning in another language, the translator must correctly interpret the author's meaning. Moreover, translation is an entirely different matter from manuscript variance. To believe that the King James translation was perfect, one must not only hold that the King James translation of the entire Bible was perfect, but that every manuscript choice of the sources they were working from was perfect. That's ridiculous. There are literally thousands of textual differences, often very small, between various biblical manuscripts. A wealth of manuscripts, which greatly assist in identifying proper readings, is now available. Many of those manuscripts were not known or used by the King James translators, but some of them almost certainly would have been used by them if they had access to them. In fact, the King James translators themselves recommended consulting a variety of translations and sources, unlike King James Onlyus in our day. The King James translators would not even agree with the King James Onlyus on how they use their translation. All of this further illustrates why King James Onlyism is a non-Christian heresy adopted by people who have resisted the true revelation of Christianity and fashioned a false source of revelation in its place. Stephen Anderson also rejects the teaching of Jesus Christ and the New Testament on the indissolubility of marriage. Although Anderson admits that according to the New Testament, it is adultery for a married person to get divorced and enter a, quote, new or second marriage, he also heretically says that once the person has been, quote, remarried in the adulterous union, the person must not leave the adulterous union and that the situation eventually ceases to be adultery. I am divorced and remarried. Okay. And... I know the Bible says that remarriage, that you're causing someone else to commit adultery. Um, am I committing forever adultery by being remarried? No, I, I do not believe that you're in a continual state of adultery. I think that it was you committed sin when you got remarried. You know, that was committing adultery by marrying someone else. But, you know, now that you're married, now that you've made a vow to that person, you're supposed to keep that vow. And I do not believe that you're in a continual state of adultery. There are people that will teach that, oh, you know, you need to go back to your first husband. But that is a lie because, um, honestly, the Bible says that if you've been remarried, it's an abomination to go back to your first husband. I, I believe that's Deuteronomy 24, verse 4. So, okay. you know, uh, you're never supposed to go back to your first husband after you've been remarried. But, but obviously, people who've been divorced and they've not yet been remarried they're supposed to reconcile with their first spouse and go back to their first husband, of course. But once you get right. married a second time, you know, you have to just stick with, with who you're married to now. Does that answer your question? You know, if that's your story, if you've done that in the past, then you just need to confess it as a sin to God one time. Just admit it to God. It was a sin. I was wrong. I'm sorry. And then you move on. Anderson's false and heretical position on this matter is connected to the fact that he fails to distinguish between the precepts of the Mosaic Law and the teaching of Jesus Christ and the New Testament on marriage. As the New Testament teaches, the Mosaic Law contained dispensations on marriage for the hardness of people's hearts at the time that do not exist in and are not applicable to Christian marriage. Mark chapter 10. They said, Moses allowed a man to write a bill of divorce and to send her away. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he wrote this commandment for you. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let not man separate. Then in the house, the disciples asked him again about this matter. He said to them, Whoever divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another, she commits adultery. Luke 16, 18. Everyone who divorces his wife and marries another commits adultery. And he who marries a woman divorced from her husband commits adultery. Romans 7, 3. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she is joined to another man while her husband is alive. 1 Corinthians 7. The wife should not separate from her husband, but if she does, she should remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband. Anderson's heresy rejects the teaching of Jesus Christ, the gospel, and the New Testament on the indissolubility of marriage, and through it he confirms people in adultery and on the path to hell. Stephen Anderson also denies that Mary is the mother of God. 
He thinks that's a false doctrine and a heresy, when actually what he believes is a heresy and a blasphemy that denies the truth about Jesus Christ. She's the mother of Jesus only in an earthly sense, and taking that logical leap to calling her the mother of God is false doctrine and heresy. Anderson argues that even though Jesus is God and Mary is the mother of Jesus, Mary is not the mother of God because God created her. Before we refute and expose this false argument, consider the following. The heresy that Anderson promotes on this issue, which denies that Mary is the mother of God, is called the Nestorian heresy. The Christian church, that is the Catholic church, condemned it in the 5th century. The Nestorian heresy, which Anderson and many other non-Catholics hold, divides Jesus into two persons. It denies that Jesus Christ is a single divine person with two natures. Adherents of this heresy don't actually believe that the Son of God, the second person of the Holy Trinity, became man. Rather, they hold that Jesus was a man who was united to the person of the Son of God. Hence, they divide Jesus into two different persons or two different individuals. Notice that Anderson explicitly says that Mary is not the mother of God and not the mother of Christ, but only the mother of the man Jesus. Was Jesus physically descended from Mary? Yes, he was. But is Mary the mother of God? No. Is Mary the mother of Christ? No. Mary's the mother of the man Jesus. To say that Mary is the mother of the man Jesus, but not of the Christ, is to deny that the man Jesus equals the Christ. But scripture, of course, explicitly refers to the man Christ Jesus. The man is the Christ. Jesus is a single person. He is God and man and Christ. Anderson's statement rejects a fundamental truth of Christianity, that the man Jesus is the Christ. Is Mary the mother of Christ? No, Mary's the mother of the man Jesus. Further, to say that Mary is the mother of Jesus but not of God is to deny that Jesus is God. Now, the argument raised by heretics like Anderson is that Jesus existed before Mary and created her, so Mary cannot be the mother of God. So, although Jesus is God and although Mary is the mother of Jesus, you're using faulty logic here because she is only the mother of Jesus, humanly speaking, because Jesus, as God, existed before Mary was ever born. So she's not the mother of God. She's the mother of Jesus only in an earthly sense. And taking that logical leap to calling her the mother of God is false doctrine and heresy. But that argument only reveals how completely they fail to understand this issue and the Christian faith. What heretics such as Anderson don't get is that since Jesus Christ is one divine person with two natures, what is predicated of, that is, what is affirmed as an attribute of, Jesus' human nature is predicated of or affirmed as an attribute of his divine person, the second person of the Holy Trinity, even though it's not predicated of his divine nature. Let me say that again. What is predicated of or affirmed as an attribute of Jesus' humanity is predicated of or affirmed as an attribute of his divine person, even though it's not predicated of his divine nature, because the word became flesh, John 1.14. To put it another way, Jesus' human qualities, attributes, and experience truly belong to the one Jesus who is God, even though they are not his divine attributes or predicated of his divine nature. That's because Jesus, the Son of God, is one divine person with two natures. There aren't two Jesuses. We see this truth in scripture, for example, Revelation 2.8, quote, The first and the last, who is dead and came to life, says these things, end quote. These are the words of Jesus Christ recorded by St. John. Jesus identifies himself as the first and the last. The first and the last is a title of God. See Isaiah 44.6, quote, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God, end quote. In Revelation 2.8, Jesus is identifying himself as God and speaking of his divine person. Yet he states that he is the first and the last, quote, who was dead. In this verse, the words who was dead refer grammatically to the first and the last. They refer to God. But God, the first and the last, cannot die in his divine nature. God cannot die as God, for if he did, then everything would cease to exist. God upholds everything by the word of his power, Hebrews 1.3. By him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17, 28. If God died or was dead in his divine nature, then there would be nothing left in existence. Also, being immutable, God can't undergo a change such as going from alive to dead. It's impossible for God to die in his divine nature, but even though the first and the last cannot die as God, Scripture states that the first and the last was dead because God the Son was dead as man in his humanity. 
and what is predicated of Jesus as man in his humanity is truly predicated of the person of God the Son, even though it is not predicated of his divine nature or attributes. That's why Mary is truly the mother of God, and those who deny it reject Jesus. To deny that Mary is the mother of God is equivalent to denying that the first and the last was dead. In a similar way, Revelation 2.8 says that the first and the last came to life, but God can't come to life in his divine nature. God always exists. He is always alive. Exodus 3.14, quote, I am who am. Even though God cannot come to life in his divine nature, Revelation 2.8 says that the first and the last who is dead came to life because what is predicated of Jesus as man in his humanity is truly predicated of the person of God the Son, even though it is not predicated of his divine nature. Indeed, if what is predicated of Jesus' humanity were not predicated of his divine person, then you could never worship the man Christ Jesus. That's because Jesus' flesh and blood were created. They did not exist from all eternity. Unlike Jesus' uncreated divine nature which always existed, his human nature was created in time and assumed by the word when he became man in the womb of the Virgin Mary. Even though Jesus' flesh and blood are not part of his divine nature and they did not always exist, true Christians worship Jesus in the flesh because the Son of God truly became man and is one divine person with two natures. Thus, Anderson and other heretics completely miss the point and expose the utter falsity of their position when they assert that Mary cannot be the mother of God because Jesus existed before Mary and created her. Because Jesus, as God, existed before Mary was ever born. Yes, the Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Eternal Word, existed from all eternity in his divine nature and as a divine person, the second person of the Holy Trinity. He created all things, including Mary. Mary did not bring forth or give birth to his divine nature, and to assert that she did would be heresy, just as it would be heresy to hold that God was dead in his divine nature. But that fact, as those who understand the Christian faith and believe in Jesus know, does not in any way contradict the truth that Mary is the mother of God, because, as we've seen, the Son of God who existed from all eternity also became man in time, and the human nature he assumed is his own and what is predicated of Jesus Christ's flesh, blood, and humanity, including having died and having been conceived in Mary and born of her, is predicated of God the Son, because he, Jesus Christ, is one divine person with two natures. Thus Mary, who gave birth to God the Son in his humanity, is the mother of God, just as the first and the last, who only died in his humanity, was dead. That's what heretics such as Anderson don't understand and don't believe because they are not Christian. And let's be clear, everyone who denies that Mary is the mother of God rejects Jesus Christ. They deny that she is the mother of God precisely because they resist and reject the truth about Jesus. Moreover, in support of their heresy, heretics such as Anderson sometimes attempt to reference Hebrews 7.3. It refers to Melchizedek as without father, without mother, and being likened to or resembling the Son of God. I showed him this scripture, I showed him Hebrews 7.3, where the Bible says of Jesus, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days, so did Jesus ever have a beginning? No. Nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abide the priest continually. So Jesus had no father, no mother, no descent, no beginning of days, nor anybody. He, he's always been. He's God. First, Anderson totally misquotes Hebrews. The passage does not say that Jesus Christ was without father, without mother. It's a statement about Melchizedek, not Jesus. So Anderson has misrepresented the teaching of Hebrews. Some people such as Anderson believe that Melchizedek, the first person in the Bible called a priest, was not just a type of Jesus, but rather a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus in the Old Testament. That's not correct. Melchizedek was not Jesus, but a type of him. The fact that Melchizedek is not Jesus is why Melchizedek is distinguished from the Lord Jesus Christ in various passages, such as Psalm 110, a messianic psalm. There the Lord Jesus is addressed as you in the second person, while Melchizedek is addressed in the third person. They are not the same person. The statement that Melchizedek was without father, without mother, in Hebrews 7.3, indicates that Melchizedek's genealogy was not recorded or known. 
The context of Hebrews 7 concerns the nature of priesthood and priestly qualification. Melchizedek's lack of genealogy served to distinguish his priesthood from that of Aaron's, which was connected to genealogy. The statement that Melchizedek was without beginning of days or end of life indicates that, unlike Levitical priests who could only serve for a period of time, Melchizedek's priesthood was not limited to a period of time. Melchizedek's priesthood was distinct from and superior to the Levitical priesthood, like that of Christ, who is a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. So Melchizedek was not Jesus, but he and his priesthood were a type of Jesus. That's why Melchizedek is described as like or resembling the Son of God, he was a type of him in various ways, and not identified as the Son of God. But even if someone holds the false view that Melchizedek was a pre-incarnate appearance of the Son of God in the Old Testament, that does not contradict the fact that Mary is the mother of God, because the Son of God had not yet taken flesh from Mary at the time of Melchizedek. Mary became the mother of God at the time the Son of God was conceived and became flesh in her womb. Thus, the argument advanced by various heretics on this matter has no merit whatsoever. Further, to show how specious it is, consider that the eternal Son of God most certainly has an eternal Father. The Son of God is not without Father in his divine nature. Also, the Son of God, after the Incarnation, most certainly has a human genealogy. Matthew 1.1, quote, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. To deny that the genealogy of Jesus Christ is the human genealogy of the Son of God is simply to deny that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. It is to hold that Jesus Christ is one person and that the Son of God is a different person. That's heresy and blasphemy, but it's the result of denying that Mary is the mother of God. As St. Peter correctly proclaimed, Jesus Christ and the Son of God are the same person. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's why Mary, who is described as his, that is, Jesus Christ's mother, in Matthew 1.18, is truly the mother of God. So they can't argue that all these words, without father, without mother, without genealogy, which were written about Melchizedek, apply to the son's divine nature, for the son has a father in his divine nature. And they can't argue that all these words apply to the son's human nature after the incarnation, for he has a genealogy and of course a mother in his human nature. But their argument requires them to hold that all these words refer to the same category and don't switch back and forth between categories. Therefore, in making their argument, they could only assert that without father, without mother, without genealogy, which was written about Melchizedek, if applied to the son, means that he was without human father, without human mother, without human genealogy, before the incarnation. And that, of course, proves nothing for them because Mary did not become the mother of God until the incarnation, when the word became flesh in her womb. Thus, all variations of this argument are utterly specious and fallacious. That's because the passage about Melchizedek does not in any way teach or support what they think it does. Anderson also argues that Matthew 22 proves that Mary cannot be the mother of God because it supposedly teaches that Christ is not the son of David. Now look at Matthew 22, and this will help you interpret Hebrews 7.3. It says, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They say unto him, the son of David. He saith unto them, How then did David in spirit call him Lord? Saying, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. If David then calleth him Lord, how is he his son? And no man was able to answer him a word. Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. So look, if he's saying, How is he the son of David? If David calls him Lord. But let me tell you something. Jesus created Mary. How is he Mary's son? Jesus created David. He, he, I mean, he's preaching this to Pharisees. How can you say that Christ is the son of David when he created David? When David calls him Lord. Okay, do you see what I'm saying here? Anderson thinks that Jesus is teaching that Christ, the Messiah, who is Lord, cannot be David's son because if he were, then David could not call him Lord. Anderson's argument on this matter exposes that he's as blind to the truth about Jesus Christ as Pharisees who rejected him. Anderson has totally failed to understand the passage. What Jesus is doing is stumping the Pharisees by asking them about the mystery of the incarnate word, the mystery of the God-man. The Pharisees did not know or understand this mystery, but Jesus did. Jesus knew that he, the Christ, who is both true God and true man, existed before David and created him, but also descended from him as man. That's how the Christ could be both David's Lord and his son or descendant. Thus, Jesus confounded the Pharisees by asking them about that mystery of the God-man, who is one divine person with two natures, a mystery taught in the Old Testament scriptures, but one which the Pharisees did not know or understand. 
Jesus was not in any way denying that Christ, the Lord, is a son or descendant of David, as the blind heretic Anderson wrongly implies. The fact that Mary is the mother of God is why we read this in Luke 143. Quote, and why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? End quote. The Bible teaches that Mary is the mother of the Lord. The Lord referred to in this context is God. Luke 1 uses the term Lord 17 times and all the references are to God. Indeed, another proof that the Lord referred to in Luke 143 is God is found in the parallels between Luke 1 and 2 Samuel 6. They show that Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant in addition to being the mother of God. The Ark of the Old Covenant was the sacred chest accompanied by the spiritual presence of God, his glory cloud. It contained the sacred tablets with the written word of God, as well as the manna from the desert and the rod of Aaron signifying the true high priesthood. Well, Mary contained Jesus Christ. Jesus is the word of God himself, John 1.1, 1, 1, the true manna from heaven, John 6.48-51, and the true high priest, Hebrews 3.1. The Ark of the Old Covenant was a type of the Virgin Mary, just as its contents were a type of Jesus Christ. That's because Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. Consider the stunning parallels between how 2 Samuel 6 describes the Ark of the Old Covenant and how Luke chapter 1 describes Mary. In 2 Samuel 6, 9, David says, quote, How shall the Ark of the Lord come to me? In Luke 1, Elizabeth says in reference to Mary, And why has this happened to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? The statements are parallel because the Bible is identifying Mary as the Ark of the New Covenant. Moreover, in 2 Samuel 6, 9, the Lord referred to is, of course, God. Likewise, in Luke 1, the Lord referred to, when it says, the mother of my Lord, is God the Son. She is the mother of God. But the parallels between the Ark of the Old Covenant and Mary continue. In 2 Samuel 6, 16, we read that David leapt before the Ark. In Luke 1, 41-44, we read that the infant leapt in the presence of Mary. In 2 Samuel 6, 11, we read that the ark stayed with Obededom for three months. In Luke 1, 56, we read that Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months. And there's more. In Revelation 11:19, we read that the ark of his covenant was seen. And in the very next verse, Revelation 12, 1, we read a description of a woman. The biblical certainty that Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant is also confirmed by the parallel between Exodus 40.35 and Luke 1.35. God's presence overshadowed the Ark in the Old Testament just as the Most High will overshadow Mary. The same Greek verb, episkiadzo, is used in both verses, that is, in the Greek of Luke 1.35 and in the Greek translation of Exodus 40.35, the Septuagint, to describe how God comes upon the respective Arks of the Covenant. In addition to being the mother of God, Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. There is absolutely no doubt about it. The fact that Mary, who contained God himself, is the Ark of the New Covenant was recognized by numerous church fathers, including St. Athanasius, an individual many Protestants would claim to recognize as an important early Christian. The fact that Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant tells us quite a bit about her. The Ark of the Old Covenant was the holiest thing on earth outside of God himself. We read in 2 Samuel 6 that God struck Uzzah dead for touching it. Concerning this event, Protestant R.C. Sproul stated, quote, Uzzah assumed that his hand was less polluted than the earth. God did not want his holy throne touched by that which was contaminated by evil, end quote. Sproul's comment illustrates quite well why Mary, from whom the Son of God took his humanity, was so special and had to be preserved from all stain of original sin. Just as the Ark of the Old Covenant was built to be holy and made from the most pure gold, Mary, the Ark of the New Covenant, was graced by God for her unique purpose and role of being created in a state of sinlessness and perfection. For more on that, see our video, Mary's Sinlessness, a Biblical Documentary. The Ark of the Old Covenant also had tremendous power over the devil and over God's enemies in aiding the people of God, just as Mary does. In Isaiah 7.14, we read, quote, A virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, God with us, end quote. The Bible teaches that Mary is the mother of Emmanuel, God with us. Luke 1.31-32 teaches that Mary's son is the son of the highest. All of this should be clear, but also consider Galatians 4.4, 4, quote, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his Son, born of woman, born under the law, end quote. Notice, referring to the Son of God, Galatians 4.4 4 teaches that he was born of woman. Well, as we've discussed, Jesus Christ's divine nature did not come from Mary. He was only born of woman in his humanity. But Galatians 4.4 4 declares that the Son was born of woman, 
because what is predicated of Jesus' humanity is predicated of the person of the Son, for he is a single divine person with two natures. Thus, Scripture directly teaches that the Son was born of Mary, which of course makes Mary the mother of God. Those who deny it reject Scripture and are heretics. The Christian faith recognizes and teaches that the Son of God had two births. The Son of God was begotten or born from all eternity in his divine nature from the Father. Note well that the Son was not created by the Father. He is eternal, but he was born or begotten by the Father from all eternity. That's part of the mystery of the Trinity. The Son of God comes forth from the Father from all eternity, and the Holy Ghost proceeds eternally from the Father and the Son. John 8, 42, quote, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I came forth from God, and I am here. John 16, 28, quote, I came forth from the Father, and have come into the world. The Son is the Son, and the Father is the Father, precisely because the Son came forth from the Father from all eternity in his divine nature. But the Son of God had another birth, in time, in his humanity, from Mary. Since what is predicated of the Son's humanity is truly predicated of his person, Mary is the mother of God, and those who deny it aren't Christian. As the dogmatic Council of Chalcedon correctly declared, quote, We all with one voice teach the confession of one and the same Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the same perfect in divinity and perfect in humanity, the same truly God and truly man of a rational soul and body, consubstantial with the Father as regards the divinity, and the same consubstantial with us as regards the humanity, like us in all respects except for sin, begotten before the ages from the Father as regards the divinity, and in the last days the same for us and for our salvation from Mary, the Virgin Mother of God, as regards the humanity, one and the same Christ, Son, Lord, only begotten, acknowledged in two natures which undergo no confusion, no change, no division, no separation. At no point was the difference between the natures taken away through the union, but rather the property of both natures is preserved and comes together into a single person and a single subsistent being. He is not parted or divided into two persons, but is one and the same, only begotten Son, God, Word, Lord Jesus Christ, just as the prophets taught from the beginning about him, and as the Lord Jesus Christ himself instructed us, and as the creed of the fathers handed it down to us. In this video, we've proven beyond a shadow of a doubt that Stephen Anderson is not a Christian. He is a total heretic, a blasphemer, and an idolater who rejects the teaching of the Bible. We could expose even more of his errors and heresies if we wanted to, but we've demonstrated that he's not a Christian. Some people are deceived by the fact that Anderson preaches truth on some matters, for which he is unjustly attacked by various proponents of an anti-Christian agenda. Don't be so easily misled. Just as the devil raises up people on the left, he also sets up false teachers among so-called conservatives. The devil uses people who say some good things and condemn certain evils, but simultaneously deceive people with heresies and a false gospel. Anderson is without any doubt a false teacher of the devil, who is on the road to damnation and leading others there. St. Ambrose noted that every assembly of heretics and schismatics belongs not to God, but to the unclean spirit. This fact is quite evident in the case of Anderson's false and demonic congregation. It belongs to an unclean or bad spirit. Notice that Anderson even admits that he has a bad spirit. Friends, look at this! And you say, oh, you know, you have a bad spirit. You better know I do! Anderson also asked his son to identify the person he wants to meet when he, quote, gets to heaven. His son responded by saying that he wants to meet Legion. Legion is a group of demons described in the New Testament. You know, it reminds me of, I asked my son, John, I said, you know, who do you want to, who do you want to meet when you get to heaven? And he said, I want to meet Legion. And I'm like, what are you, Legion, what? But he meant the guy, he meant the guy who had the Legion. It's not a surprise that Anderson's son named Legion, a group of demons, as the person he wanted to meet, for Anderson is raising his children in a demonic false church which is dominated by unclean and evil spirits. As a demonic heretic who hates Jesus Christ and his church, Anderson follows the devil in attacking and mocking the fathers of the Christian church, its saints, and the Christian church's patrimony. So they all get together and agree at this ecumenical council and they come out with the Nicene Creed of, hey, this is what we all believe as Christians. Think about getting a bunch of phony preachers together. You know, I would never go to such a thing. Neither would any Bible-believing Christian. Neither did any Bible-believing Christian. Pastor Anderson, you're ignorant of church history. You need to read the church fathers. You need to read Polycarp. 
You need to read Clement of Rome. You need to read the Church Fathers. Yes, the pagan Anderson, who, as we've seen, utterly rejects the person of Jesus Christ, totally perverts scripture, and worships the Bible as God, mocks the Church of Jesus Christ because he hates Christ, and he rejects the true Christian faith. In his foolishness, he fails to recognize that he simultaneously relies on the Catholic Church, its apostolic tradition, and the fathers of the Church to identify the authors of New Testament books and to determine which books are part of the New Testament canon. From ancient times, the four Gospels were associated in manuscripts and in tradition with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But the words that are considered part of the Gospels themselves don't identify the authors of the Gospels, and the Bible does not give us the list of books that are in the Bible. Those facts are learned and or confirmed from extra-biblical sources, namely the apostolic tradition, the fathers of the church, and the Catholic Church's teaching. As Protestant scholar Michael Kruger admitted, the early tradition and the testimony of the church fathers is a crucial component in identifying and confirming the authorship of the Gospels. In the Gospels themselves, there are what we call formally anonymous. What that means is in the text itself, it doesn't say John wrote this or Matthew wrote this. Now, should that be a concern? Well, actually not. When we think about ancient biographies, ancient biographies often were formally anonymous. So the gospel is leaving the names of the author outside the text formally is not at all unusual. So then how do you know who wrote these books? Well, several ways that we uh, conclude that the authors uh, that wrote them are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and it's simply this. First, the titles of the books. Our earliest manuscripts of these gospel texts all have the titles attached to them, and we can see them. So as far back as we can see, these gospels had the titles with them. But moreover, one has to ask the question, if these titles were a late edition, how is it that we have such uniformity in what these documents were called? If Matthew's Gospel, for example, wasn't called Matthew's Gospel until late in the second century, then why don't we have a number of copies of Matthew's Gospels with different titles, with different names? In fact, we don't possess that. What we find is incredible uniformity across the board of the titles of these Gospels. Matthew's Gospel is called Matthew. Mark's is called Mark's. It's amazingly consistent, something we would not expect if the titles were added later. There's actually more evidence than that for why we know the Gospels are written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and that is we have very strong patristic testimony in this regard. Papias, who was an early church bishop in the early second century, tells us and confirms for us that Matthew was the author of Matthew and Mark was the author of Mark. Papias was said to have heard the Gospel of John preach. If so, then he's only one step removed from the apostles themselves. Also, church father by the name of Irenaeus in the late second century tells us that these four Gospels were written by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Where would Irenaeus have gotten his information from? Well, we're told in the other early Christian writings that Irenaeus was a disciple of Polycarp. And Polycarp was a disciple of John the Apostle himself. So whatever Irenaeus tells us about the authors of the Gospels, most likely he got that from Polycarp, who got that from the Apostle John. That is a very reliable historical sequence. There are very good reasons to think that Irenaeus knows better who the Gospel authors are than modern scholars. Such facts demolish the utterly illogical Protestant heresy of sola scriptura, a heresy that is directly contrary to the Bible's teaching. See, for example, 2 Thessalonians 2.15, among other verses. Apostolic tradition is inextricably connected to the identification and the use of the scriptures. Thus, the inconsistency and foolishness of Anderson is on display when he proclaims that the Bible is his sole authority, while he simultaneously relies, whether he realizes it or not, on extra-biblical sources and the Catholic Church's tradition to determine which books are in the New Testament and who wrote the books. No true Christian in history ever believed what Anderson does, which is why Anderson attacks the entire history of the Christian Church. Further, while Anderson attacks the Council of Nicaea, he might not even claim to believe in the Trinity today if it had not been for what happened there. In fact, in the following clips we hear Stephen Anderson and his good friend and fellow Baptist, quote, pastor Roger Jimenez teach heresy against the Trinity. In these clips, Stephen Anderson and Roger Jimenez both teach the modalist heresy that God is one person who assumes different modes or forms rather than one God in three distinct persons. In these clips, both Anderson and Jimenez teach the heresy that Jesus is God the Father. Jimenez even heretically says that Jesus is the Holy Ghost. You know, they say, oh, you and your wife are one. I had some Mormons tell me. I said, what if I said to you, if you've seen me, you've seen my wife. You know, no, we're two different, we're two distinctly separate people. But Jesus said, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. And then Philip said, 
show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. He said, Philip, have you been with me so long and you haven't known me, Philip? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And how sayest thou, show us the Father? What do you want me to show you? He's saying, I am the Father. I mean, how much clearer could you get in John 14 when he sits there and tells Philip, look, how can I show you the Father when I am the Father? Do you believe that Jesus is God the Father and God the Son at the same time? You say, how can you believe that? Well, we believe that because we believe a doctrine called, and this doctrine is going by the wayside, but we believe in a doctrine called the Trinity. So you say, do you believe that Jesus is the Son of God? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus is God the Father? Yes. Do you believe that Jesus is the Holy Ghost? I believe he's all of them because he's the Father, because we have the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. Their statements that Jesus is God the Father, and Jimenez's additional statement that Jesus is the Holy Ghost, are heretical and contradict the truth of the Trinity. Now it should be noted that Stephen Anderson, and presumably Jimenez as well, currently claims to totally reject modalism, and he has publicly spoken against it. With regard to the clip in which he taught that Jesus is the Father, He sits there and tells Philip, look, how can I show you the Father when I am the Father? Anderson characterizes that as sloppy teaching that does not reflect his actual position. Nevertheless, the statements are powerful examples of how when heretics who are outside the true church of Jesus Christ, such as Stephen Anderson and Roger Jimenez, try to teach scripture and Christianity, since they are not led, instructed, or guided by the church's dogmatic teaching and the church's rule of faith, they often fall into very significant heresies and false doctrines that contradict core truths of Christianity. In John 14, Jesus did not say that he is the Father, but that the one who has seen me has seen the Father. That's because Jesus and the Father, while distinct persons, have the exact same divine nature or divinity. In the Trinity, there is unity in nature and distinction in persons. The one true God is Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the three persons together, and each distinct person of the Trinity is God, because each one has the fullness of the divine nature. Yet there is only one God, because of the three there is one substance, one essence, one nature, one divinity, one immensity, and one eternity. And all are one, where no opposition of relation precludes this. There is one God and three divine persons. In Anderson's heretical non-Christian, quote, church, we also recognize another characteristic of antichrist sex, that is, the substitution of man for God. In the true Christian church, that is, in the traditional Catholic church, the Eucharist and the Mass is the focal point of the church and the reason people show up. A priest has a role to say Mass, preach, etc., but the focus of the church and the reason people go is for God himself who is present in the Eucharist, not man. People come to see Jesus Christ, not man. That's how God intended it. Now, during the Great Apostasy, the Eucharist has been taken away from much of the world, as our material explains, but Jesus as the focal point of the church was how it was in all true Christian churches in history. The Bible teaches that the Eucharist, properly consecrated by a valid priest, is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. See Jesus' words in John chapter 6 that you must eat his flesh and drink his blood to have life in you, and his proclamation in the Gospels that this is my body and this is my blood. Notice that Anderson even admits that Jesus is the Passover lamb, and that when they ate the Passover lamb in the Old Testament, that lamb represented Christ. But we know that when they ate the Passover in the Old Testament, what animal did they eat? The lamb. And when they ate that lamb of the Passover, that lamb represented who? Jesus. Anderson fails to see that the eating of the lamb in the Old Testament prefigured how true Christians would eat and receive the Lamb of God in the Eucharist. Since he rejects the teaching of Jesus and the Bible on this matter, Anderson is moved by the devil to blaspheme Jesus in the Eucharist and to express the demonic hatred for Jesus that is harbored by the evil spirit that dominates him. That little wafer that he holds up, you know what people used to do in England? during the Reformation would just grab it out of his hand and throw it on the ground and stomp on it. Your stupid cracker isn't Jesus. The entire ancient Christian church recognized that the Bible teaches that Jesus is present in the Eucharist, but that truth of the Christian faith is denied by thousands of counterfeit sects that falsely claim to be Christian. So in true Christian churches, people came to church to see Jesus present in the Eucharist, not man. However, when the Antichrist Protestant Revolution occurred, the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist was denied. As a result, Jesus was expelled from their, quote, churches, and man, the heretical, quote, preacher, replaced Jesus as the focal point and the center. 
The so-called preacher or the so-called minister, not Jesus, became the primary, if not the only reason people showed up for church. Man had replaced God. While this antichrist substitution of man for Christ is present in every Protestant, quote, church, it's more obvious in some non-Catholic sects than in others. In the case of Anderson's Antichrist sect, it's quite obvious. Notice that the people at Anderson's, quote, church show up to essentially stare at Anderson as he speaks, performs, and entertains. It's man in the place of God. He's going to be like, I know, I was listening up in heaven, and was, you know, I was like, yes. <laughs> and you know what? Let me tell you something. I'm sick of it. And I'm not going to back down. And I'm sick of people not backing me up on this. And you know what? If you're not going to back us up, then get out of here. We don't need your help. So they all just, oh, I love this movie. Oh, this is exactly what I'm going through. Oh, this is, I feel the same. I'm hungry, too. Bam, bam, bam. Okay. Stop in the name of love. Before you break my heart. Well, if I'm supposed to preach and cry loud and spare not and lift up my voice like a trumpet, I mean, does that mean I'm supposed to get up here and go, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo As we've shown in this video, among the many outrageous heresies promoted by the non Christian Stephen Anderson, his false gospel of salvation stands out. It is what defines him. Anderson holds that there's nothing a, quote, believer can do to be banned from heaven, including commit murder, adultery, fornication, etc. Anderson thus teaches that a, quote, believer can literally mock God in word or by one's sins, and the result will not be corruption and damnation, but eternal life. As we've shown, that is a false gospel. It is heretical and the opposite of the Bible's teaching. Now, in 2016, something occurred which served as another very interesting and providential condemnation of the false prophet Anderson and his false gospel. Anderson had scheduled a major, quote, soul-winning marathon in South Africa. He had spent months planning the event. But as the day came closer, pro-homosexual groups were pressuring the then Minister of Home Affairs in South Africa, named Minister Jigaba, to ban Anderson from the country for statements Anderson has made about homosexuals. In a video posted on September 6, 2016, shortly before he was set to leave for the event, Anderson dismissed the notion that he would be banned from South Africa. He even mocked Minister Jigaba, the South African official who was being pressured to ban him from the country. Anderson confidently proclaimed that Minister Jigaba will not and cannot ban him from entering the country. Anderson's video mocking the Minister of South Africa and dismissing efforts to get him banned from the country was called Minister Jigaba is a Joke. First of all, this Minister Jigaba, who is the uh, government official that I guess they've been trying to get to ban me from the country. I mean, this guy is such a joke, and it's so funny. I mean, look, if he was going to ban me, he would have done it months ago. The truth is, he can't legally ban me from entering the country. So, anyway, I just wanted to make it clear for those who have bought into some of the lies in these media articles that this event is going on full speed ahead. There's no limitation to it. There's no canceling of the event. Well, you know what? You're never going to stop the gospel from going forth. People are going to be saved on Saturday, September 17th, and people are going to be saved on Sunday, September 18th. As we can see, Anderson mocked the official of South Africa, as well as the idea that he had the authority or the willingness to ban him from the country. Anderson was so confident that he would not be banned from the land that he mocked South Africa's Minister of Home Affairs prior to the trip. In Anderson's mind, he would certainly get into the country, and there was nothing he was doing that could get him banned. Well, exactly one week later, on September 13, 2016, Anderson was at the airport, and he reported the following. Hey everybody, Pastor Stephen Anderson here from Faithful Word Baptist Church in Tempe, Arizona. Just wanted to give you a quick update on what's going on. Yesterday, Monday morning, I showed up at the airport for my flight, which was going to connect through London and take me to Johannesburg, South Africa. I checked in for the flight on Sunday. Everything was cool. I got there Monday, checked my bags, you know, gave my passport, went through security, did the whole process, had something to eat, and I'm sitting outside the gate less than an hour from departure. And all of a sudden I get paged by security and they tell me 
that the United Kingdom has banned me from entering the country and that I can't even so much as have a connecting flight in London. So not only am I banned from the United Kingdom, but I can't even go to the London airport. So anyway, I had to leave security, go down to the ticket desk and sort that out. They had to give me a whole new itinerary, you know, that would bypass England basically. And it was too late in the day to go yesterday. So I wasn't gonna be going until today. Well, of course, overnight, the, the message came through that South Africa has banned me from entering the country. It's really too bad that South Africa fell through because you know they've they've banned me personally they've banned the soul winning event so after presumptuously confidently and boldly proclaiming that quote he can't legally ban me the truth is he can't legally ban me from entering the country and if he was going to ban me he would have done it months ago i mean look if he was going to ban me he would have done it months ago which is reminiscent of the once saved always saved heresy according to which God can't ban a quote believer from heaven later on in his or her life for offensive actions. Anderson then faced the stark reality that he was indeed banned, shut out, and barred from South Africa, contrary to his assertion that it would not happen. They've banned me personally, they've banned the soul winning event. And it was Minister Jigaba himself, the man whom Anderson mocked, the man whom Anderson stated could not legally ban him, who in fact banned him from the country. It's not just a coincidence that this happened in this way. It is absolutely providential. Make no mistake about it. God allowed it to occur exactly in this way because it's a microcosm of what will happen to Anderson and those who follow his heretical false gospel if they don't convert to the true faith. Indeed, just as Anderson mocked Minister Jigaba and treated his position as a joke. First of all, this Minister Jigaba. I mean, this guy is such a joke, and it's so funny. Anderson likewise mocks God and treats his commandments as a joke by teaching that a man can sow to his flesh and commit other mortal sins and still get into the kingdom of heaven. Listen to me. If you're saved, you can sin on an ongoing basis and repeatedly. There are people who do it. There's nothing I can do to go to hell because I'm saved. And just as Minister Jigaba proved Anderson's presumptuous assertions totally wrong by banning him from the country, God will prove Anderson's false gospel wrong by banning Anderson from the kingdom of heaven if he remains a heretic. In fact, it's truly remarkable that in Anderson's report about being banned, he said this. Banned from the UK, banned from South Africa. You know, where will I be banned next? So where will you be banned in the future if you remain on your current path? The answer, of course, is from the kingdom of heaven. It's not possible for an unsaved person to win someone to Christ. Absolutely. I believe that God has chosen me to be a prophet to the nations, to preach the word of God. Listen to me. If you're saved, you can sin on an ongoing basis and repeatedly. There are people who do it. My dad got saved when he was 10 years old. My mom got saved at a similar age. Yeah, but I knew them and they were saved. You don't know that. You don't know that. But before we go any further, let's bring Brother Tyler Baker up here and we're gonna have him sit up here during the sermon. And I, be I believe that he will be a great man of God. And Lord, I just pray that you would please just bless Brother Baker tonight, Lord, and fill him with your spirit. And Lord, I just pray that he would do great works for you, that, that many people would be able to see them and glorify you and marvel. I, excuse me, I keep saying Brother Baker. But after watching his hour and 18 minute video, I don't believe that he's saved anymore where I believe that he was a total Judas. I believe it's possible for a saved person to become a drunkard. I believe it's possible for a saved person to become a fornicator, an adultery, even a, a adulterer, even a murderer. Bam, bam, bam. And you say, oh, you know, you have a bad spirit. You better know I do. They kill themselves, as far as I'm concerned. Is Mary the mother of Christ? No, Mary's the mother of the man, Jesus. Hey, let me say tonight, behold your God. This is God. Let me introduce you to God. It's the Bible. I get so sick of this repent of your sins garbage coming from Baptist preachers. Right. Repenting of your sins is works. And I will have zero fellowship with him ever until he repents of this heresy. So I'm saying to you tonight, hey, meet God. The truth is, he can't legally ban me from entering the country. I mean, look, if he was going to ban me, he would have done it months ago. 
banned from the UK, banned from South Africa. You know, where will I be banned next? <laughs>